All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well on this afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm John Berteau. I'm the Associate Provost for Faculty Affairs. And it really is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2023-2024 Distinguished Scholar Teacher Lecture Series. For those of you who don't know, the Distinguished Scholar Teacher Award was established in 1978 to recognize tenured faculty members who are committed to and have demonstrated excellence in instruction and in their research efforts. The award is sponsored and administered by the Office of Faculty Affairs on behalf of Pro, uh, Provost Jennifer King Rice, and recipients are, re are selected by prior DST um, uh, re um, nominees and, and recipients. I'm very pleased and honored on behalf of Provost Rice to recognize Dr. Chris Laskowski as one of our newest distinguished scholar teachers. As we will hear more shortly, um, his research, his scholarship focused primarily in model theory, which is a branch of mathematical logic. In addition to his research, um, Chris has contributed significantly to the university's learning environment, uh, engaging students in courses he teaches and through his mentorship. Provost Rice and I congratulate um, Chris on his this much deserved award and recognition. It's my pleasure now to introduce Daron Levy, Chair of the Department of Mathematics, who will formally introduce uh, Dr. Laskowski. Thank you. Thanks, John, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Doran Levy, I'm the Chair of the Math Department, and it really is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Chris Laskowski, our new Distinguished Scholar Teacher. Um, you know, uh, these introductions sometimes start with, you know, the usual stuff of like, you know, all this boring information that you can probably just read on the backside of the pamphlet that you received. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll still mention a little bit of that just to, uh, you know, honor Chris yet again. So PhD, uh, Chris received his PhD from Berkeley in 1987, after which he was a Moore instructor at MIT. And then he joined the University of Maryland in 1989 as an assistant professor doing mathematical logic. We heard that. Uh, math mathematical logic has been a big, there's a big tradition in our department for mathematical logic. And at the time that Chris joined us, how many logicians were there? Four, five. Okay, I missed by one. Uh, gradually, that number went down. And over the years, as uh, people gradually retired and were not replaced by new logicians. Uh, not that long ago, our logic group numbered one. Um, so if you look at old departmental reviews, uh, the report of the logic group was, we need more people, right? Uh, which actually happened as we recently hired two logicians, uh, Christian Rosenthal and Artem Chernikov. And now from one, we have three, and probably one of the best, or certainly one of the best uh, logic groups in the country, if not in the world. So small numbers doesn't mean low quality. Actually, when it co it's concentrated really, really well, uh, you can do wonders. Okay. Um, so I mentioned something about the trajectory of Chris uh, coming to Maryland, uh, but Chris has been nothing short of a wonderful colleague. So being a wonderful colleague is a combination of many things. It's uh, a great researcher, it's a wonderful mentor, teacher, and someone that's in charge and uh, involved, greatly involved with our outreach activities, but really a great person to have around. He's here pretty much every day, not many people are, and just seeing Chris in the corridors and welcoming him and greeting him and him greeting everyone, it's, I mean, how should I put it differently? Chris is a fixture of this department, okay? Um, so what Chris does for research is something I'm not going to attempt to tell you about, uh, <laughs> which sounds mostly like my letters for the APT uh, committee. So, uh, and, and I think that actually Chris will, also not try to make this attempt, and he promised to give us a very uh, accessible talk. Uh, so I think all of us know what averages mean, and we learn about averages of averages. Uh, but let me just say again that I'm super pleased that Chris has 
been bestowed this award of a distinguished scholar teacher by the provost office and by the University of Maryland. Congratulations, Chris. And with that, Chris Laskowski. Okay. So hopefully uh, people on Zoom can hear as well. So thank you, uh, Dr. Berto, and thank you, Doran, for the wonderful uh, introductions. I'm very honored to be here speaking in front of all of you and all everybody on Zoom. Um, I'd like to also just thank uh, both uh, Doran Levy and Larry Washington, who were both previous DST winners, and they nominated me for this. So none of this would have happened. And uh, in particular, I'd like to thank my wife, Carol DeFrancis. Uh, quite frankly, without her constant love and support, most of, much, much of my career would not have uh, transpired. So thank you. Okay, so before launching into things, uh, just in, there was discussion right at the beginning. Uh, today is Mole Day. Happy Mole Day to everybody. Um, Again, since most of you are mathematicians, you might not have heard about this. Uh, you can view this as being a chemist's knockoff of Pi Day. Uh, so think for mole, think 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And I sort of cryptically wrote this. Today is 1023. Uh, uh, the 2023 is re redundant or whatever. Um, so, uh, Unlike just reciting lots of digits of pi, uh, one tends to sit around and tell mole jokes. Uh, th this will play a part uh, as we go along. So uh, as to what I'm going to talk about, well, I uh, can read from the thing. My main field is model theory, which is a branch of mathematical logic, which is a branch of mathematics. Great. But this is really a lousy thing, say, at cocktail parties or elevator speech. It's really a bad thing. So number one, someone says, what do you do? I teach. Uh, what do you teach? Mathematics. The usual thing, majority. Oh, I really hate math. <laughs> Many times they'll say, I got up to level X, and then I had a really bad teacher. And then I can't imagine what life's beyond that. Okay. Um, but then there are a few people who say, math, okay, yeah, what kind of math? And then you say, mathematical logic, and you can see that they tense up. <laughs> oh, no. And like look down at their hands. They're sure that the next words out of my mouth are going to be, this statement is false, or some sort of a paradoxical thing. They're, they're looking and trying to remember what's the symbol, the, the Vulcan greeting from Star Trek or something like this. Uh, uh, because for whatever reason, popular press, mathematical logic uh, certainly discusses paradoxes or uh, in and around Gödel's incompleteness theorem or the collection of all sets is not a set. Uh, or uh, Bertrand's Russell, a barber can shave everyone's head except his own, uh, just all sorts of things. Um, and when I teach set theory, I try to make a really special thing. I think the term paradox is very poorly aimed. It isn't a proof that zero equals one or that things are all falling apart, but rather when you see something paradox, it means you need to be careful. It means warning, Dan something non-intuitive is going to be happening. And rather than bore you with my research, I want to give an instance of something in popular press which goes as a, a paradox, but one should really view and try to see what is going on because it really, as we'll demonstrate, has a lot of real world applications. So with that as a preamble, let's start out and let's talk about baseball. I said real world, but uh, we'll get to more things beyond that. Um, but there, so let's take two uh, uh, players. Uh, David Justice played for a while, uh, many years with Atlanta Braves, and then moved uh, moved on to um, to other teams. 
whereas Derek Jeter always played with the New York Yankees. What about them? Well, let's look at the years 1995 and 1996. Say, so start with David Justice, and uh, many of you know about uh, statistics in baseball, but one of the most popular things is batting average. So you take the number of hits, so in this case, 104, and divide by the number of times he comes up to the plate, the number of at-bats, this is just a ratio, and uh, in this case comes out to, it really should be 0 0.253, but no one says the zero, so he say he bats 253. So clearly the larger the number, the better off every uh, you're doing. So in 1995, David Justice had a uh, higher batting average than De Derek Jeter. Now you can note here that uh, for Derek Jeter, uh, the number of at-bats was somewhat lower. This was in fact his rookie season and he got called up during the year. Um, so he didn't have that many at-bats. But then now we pass to 1996 and once again, David Justice had a higher batting average than Derek Jeter. So in both years, uh, Justice's performance dominated that of Derek Jeter. But if you then take the two years combined, if you take, uh, so the combined thing, say for David Justice, uh, he had 104 hits in uh, 1995, plus um, uh, 45 hits, um, and then divide by the number of uh, at-bats is, um, sorry, is uh, 411 plus uh, 140. So this comes out to the uh, 149 over uh, 551, or in other words, a bat combined batting average of 270, but as you can clearly see, Derek Jeter's combined batting average is 310. Now, at first, this should seem kind of odd. How could it be that David Justice dominated uh, Derek Jeter in both 1995 and in 1996, but when you combine these guys, it switches? Okay, well, this is sort of what we want to be discussing with this. Now, why does this feel strange? Well, suppose we just have numbers. So we have a big number A1 and a smaller number B1 and another. So A1 is bigger than B2. A2 is bigger than B2. Then from that, if you add the two big numbers together, you get something bigger than the sum, divide by two. So the average of uh, A1 and A2 is bigger than the average of B1 and B2 whenever um, A1 and B uh, is bigger than B1 and uh, A2 is bigger than B2. Great. So, but this is not what you're doing with batting averages. Remember, batting averages are hits versus at-bats. So when you're getting this combined thing, same computation that's here, uh, you're taking the hits plus in 1995 plus the hits in 696 divided by the sum of their at-bats. And in general, this is certainly not equal to the latter. Think about the right-hand side is, as in my title, the average of averages, but this left-hand thing is not. Now, I guess uh, when I gave a talk like this before, Larry Washington pointed out, this is very close to, we spend a, the math faculty here, math faculty spends a lot of time teaching freshmen that this is not how you add fractions. <laughs> so, yeah, there's the half issue, but even without that. Okay. So um, keep that in mind. So the, the, the thing that I want you to go for going forward is the care must be taken when averaging averages. So uh, we're going to get to more sophisticated things than this, I promise. Uh, but this whole thing, this flipping that's occurring with this, goes by the name of Simpson's paradox. And from my general comments, I'm really kind of unhappy with the word paradox here, because it's simply that we need to be aware of what's going on. So 
Now, I guess this being uh, the newfangled thing, what do I mean? Simpson's paradox, I do not mean Homer. It is not named after Homer Simpson, much as he might like it to be, but rather much earlier, Edward H. Simpson, 1951, from, um, uh, from the UK, uh, a rather noted statistician at the time. Uh, always, whenever you name something in mathematics, there's some ambiguity. And some people uh, call this the Simpson-Yule effect uh, from much earlier, Yule in 1903, was a sort of aware of this kind of thing. And certainly I prefer the word effect to paradox that just uh, is saying something is happening here. Okay, now, so this is just something you should be aware of to start off, that just when you're looking at data sets, uh, and baseball certainly provides lots and lots of data sets, then stuff like this can happen. So uh, in the wild, which to as a uh, chemist just means that just uh, just in nature without any sort of contriving things, uh, it's relatively rare, but it does occur. And uh, just other baseball pairings, the most recent I could find was actually two Red Sox players, Ellsbury and Lowell, who had the same phenomenon for two years in a row, one dominating the other. I forget which was which. Uh, you can always check these. Just if you just literally Google your favorite baseball player stats, you're just going to get a listing of these, and you can do these on your own. Somebody painstakingly went through cases of All Star uh, players and found these just among All Stars, very familiar names to baseball fans. I guess the last one's a little remarkable with uh, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. These were the first three years of Gehrig's season. Uh, a career, and he Gehrig actually beat uh, Babe Ruth in batting in three years, 1923, 24, 25, but if you add up all of those together, Babe Ruth dominates uh, um, uh, Lou Gehrig in, uh, in the sum of the three. Okay, so there's more to it than just baseball. This can happen in the wild, and it can have some real-world significance, so let's just imagine now that you are a doctor circa uh, 1990. You're in a small town and uh, your specialty is kidney stone treatments. So now a patient comes in, a woman just uh, a huge amount of pain and clearly has a case of kidney stones and you want to know what to do. What, should, what procedure should you do to, uh, to, to help uh, ease her kidney stones. Well, you're in 1990 and you're on top of your game. And you've read the following thing. This is, at the time, it really was the gold standard for what you do with uh, uh, treating kidney stones. There was a long multi-year thing all in the UK uh, published in the British Medical Journal and it compared uh, again, there are a lot of words. Renal calcu calculi is, of course, kidney stones. Uh, and now it could, uh, gets a little grisly, but you can either open surgery, which is you go in and get the things. Uh, this other percutaneous, I'm not going to embarrass myself, but let's call this PN for the second method. It's a, kind of putting in a straw, a very thin thing, and trying to suck out the 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 uh, the stones and now this third newer thing was this extracorporeal so in other words outside of the body the idea is you get a machine and you just hit it just with a shock wave and the idea is to try to jiggle things around enough that you'll just pass the stone uh, but that requires extra equipment and uh, you're in this small town remember so uh, that's out of the picture so you really don't have the equipment. So you're either going to treat this patient by open surgery or this PN, the straw-like method. What do you do? Well, you look at this paper and it's very clear. Uh, the data says that open surgery succeeds 78% of the time, whereas this PN, the straw treatment, uh, succeeds 83% of the time. Done deal, right? 
accept that. If you go in and ask, does the patient have small kidney stones, then uh, uh, this treatment, oh, uh, the open surgery actually beats the going in for a straw, 93% to 87%. Uh, if, on the other hand, if the patient has large stones, it's more problematic, so the probabilities drop. But still, once again, the OS treatment, the open surgery, dominates that of, um, uh, of, of the PN. So in either subcase, if the stone is small, you should use open surgery. If the stones are large, you should use open surgery. But if you don't know the size of the stones, then, <laughs> that, 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 then you should use the straw. So now, seriously, so imagine you are this doctor. What do you do? So which treatment do you use? And then even a more basic question to you is, should you even bother to check whether the stones are big or small? Because if so, it'll maybe confuse you about what to do. Okay, so it is curious that in this paper, this, this, this really gold, stand paper, gold standard paper, they don't discuss this issue at all. They just have just the facts, here's the table, uh, here they are. Now, admittedly, they were rooting for this extracorporeal uh, thing, uh, and much of the paper is discussing that. That was the newfangled thing, and they're discussing the pros and cons of it. But uh, just in reading the paper, uh, this Simpsons uh, idea just isn't mentioned at all. A question? Yeah? So the difference is both 78% and 83%, they're both about four out of five. Yeah. And at that point, one could look at two treatments and say which one is safe, which one is dangerous. Well, but 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 then then if you're going to go to the danger route, then then certainly open surgery would presumably be worse. But in either case, it's dominating that uh, the success rate is dominating that. Okay. Well, anyway, so so I can imagine that that each of you, it being a doctor, can have different opinions about how to answer this, but at least it's an issue. Uh, okay, so let's continue on. Uh, but sometimes, and this is going to be the bulk of the talk, uh, what appears to be Simpson's effect can really be a hint at some missing causality in the data set. And if I've learned one thing in preparing this talk and uh, just thinking about things for a number of years, uh, at some level, statisticians really don't understand causality and even, even what the definitions should be for it. This isn't necessarily a failing. It's just a really uh, involved problem, and there are a lot of traps. Uh, okay, great. So... Let's first take a completely toy example that will get things across. So question, should students study for a test? Yes or no? Well, let's do a scatter plot. Uh, we're just going to randomly, so the number of hours study uh, is the x-axis and the score on the test is the y-axis. And we're just going to look at these various dots and what do you conclude? Here's all of the data you get a best fit line, and clearly <laughs> things are not good with studying. The best fit line is decidedly slopes down. In other words, if you're a student, you should not study for a test. Now, you can almost anticipate from the general shape of, of, of what I had here. Suppose I tell you that in this, that all of these top guys are graduate students. And all of these guys are undergrads. In many <laughs> cases, it's the other way. True, true. But let's, okay. So now within these subpopulations, let's try to get uh, uh, the, the best fit. Whoops, 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 whoops. Whoops, whoops, sorry. Uh, let, let, let's, let's get the best fit lines uh, for this. 
and and clearly among if you are a graduate student you should be studying for the test if you are an undergraduate then you should be studying for the test but scrolling back if you're a student you should not be studying for the test okay so one could easily look at this data set this toy and write two different contradictory compelling papers about the conclusion and in fact the thesis of this by means of subdividing what's going on the same data set can be used to justify two different contradictory uh, conclusions okay so this was all a toy uh, got a good laugh out of it but this really came up uh, probably the by far the most famous example was uh, the, the issue of graduate admissions to UC Berkeley uh, in 1973. So start off with the guts of this fact. In fall 1973, 44% of all male applicants uh, to, to graduate school were accepted, but only 35% of female applicants were accepted. And this is a pretty huge data set, 12,000. These are the precise numbers. So overall, 41% were admitted, uh, uh, but eight like this. Uh, this, if you do any sort of analysis, this is highly statistically significant. So just on a chi-square value of this, this is 110. This is huge. The probability that this could be happening by chance is, is very, very small. So this certainly would be in the realm of, of the legal system or something that uh, should, should Berkeley be sued here, say, for, uh, for sex discrimination on this, on, on, on how they get in. Uh, and as you're going through this, uh, certainly there, there exist many parallel situations where uh, in, in today's world uh, where it has entered the legal system. But given this, uh, Berkeley was quite alarmed with what's going on. Uh, so just for a thought, think to yourself, what could be happening to cause this? Uh, and uh, the provost commissioned a report which uh, actually turned out uh, the result of it. It became a seminal pick, uh, paper in statistics. Uh, it was published in Science, and, and it was a big noise when it came out. Uh, Peter Bickle, uh, all three of these were professors at, at Berkeley. Uh, Peter Bickle was uh, a young, at the time, uh, statistician, and he wrote one of the standard textbooks for uh, introductory statistics. Uh, Hamill was uh, a, an anthropologist, I couldn't find the, the field of, of O'Connell, uh, but they really studied what was going on. And they went one by one at the admissions data for each of the 85 departments on campus to see what was happening with this. And this, this all here is, is accurate data with it. Uh, now, rather than go through all 85, the top six or the six largest departments uh, on, on campus, uh, I'll fill in some of these, but, but A through F, uh, you can see at first blush that there is some wild things. So, so first of all, in A, 82% uh, women, uh, 37, 34, uh, this guy is very close to even, very close to even. So uh, say, Really, the only big place where there's a big difference in admission rate is, is in A. Uh, but if you look at this a little bit more closely, one thing you're going to observe is that there is a huge difference by department in the number of applicants. Say, number one, or the, the A is, is the engineering department. And there were 825 uh, people, uh, males, and only 108 females that were uh, admitted to it. Uh, but the admission rate into engineering was sky high. It was uh, 
uh, well, even I guess they favored women somewhat with this, but uh, at about 70%. Uh, on the other hand, say in English, and this is either English or a compendium of English comp, comp lit or something, uh, that there, there were almost twice as many women that, that applied rather than men. But note the stark difference. The admission rate was only 34, 35% uh, as opposed to up here in the 60s. So if you look at item C, there, uh, there were 560 men versus only 25 women, but yet this was a relatively easy department to get into. Uh, and, and so on. So the, the, there are big, big swings in the male to female ratio of applicants. And the admission rate is by far from, from, from being uh, uniform. Okay, and this is really what's explaining. If you go down to the 85, uh, the departmental level, uh, go, I'll now quote literally from, from the summary uh, of uh, the summary paragraph of their paper. So first of all, examination of the aggregate data, take everything all together on graduate admissions to Berkeley, uh, shows a clear but misleading pattern of bias against female applicants. We have this huge chi-square score of 110. However, when you break it down to the disaggregated data, department by department, uh, they, there were few decision-making units that show statistically significant departures from expected frequencies in either direction, and about as many units appear to favor women as opposed to favoring men. So what's happening is, is that women are, were, uh, were getting tracked or were applying to highly competitive departments, whereas men, on the other hand, we're applying to departments which accepted many more people. The ratio was uh, was different. One thing that I found surprising, just a, a couple uh, sentences down from this, the graduate departments that are easier to enter tend to be ones that require more mathematics in the introductory preparatory curriculum. And I'm curious, is that true at Maryland? That again, this was in 1973, and enough just really to state it that like engineering, I know here admits an awful lot of people, but is the engineering acceptance rate uh, much lower than uh, or much much higher than than for English? And how do English and math compare? I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, we can ask our uh, associate provost here. <laughs> this might uh, again, so so just does this. That does this final sentence still uh, hold at Maryland uh, in 2023? Okay, so let's finish with all of that and have to throw this in. What was Avogadro's favorite Olympic event? The mole vault. None of these are any good, but you have to throw them in every once in a while. Okay, onward. Um, so now that was all 1973. Let's skip ahead almost 50 years to a really odd thing uh, at first blush uh, with uh, COVID-19 in the early days of this. And uh, this, this is brought, put together by a blog post of Dana McKenzie at UCLA and uh, Jordan Ellenberg, who is uh, a professor of math at University of Wisconsin, but you can almost view him as being a hometown guy. He was uh, went to high school in in Maryland and was one of the winners of the uh, his uh, of the high school mathematics competition. A very bright guy. Um, I guess we don't want to put those updates. But uh, but also I also had the that was before I came here. But I had the pleasure of actually teaching him. Uh, while I was at MIT, I was teaching a graduate course, and he would walk over. He was an undergraduate at Harvard and came over to uh, to take this. So anyway, good guy. Uh, but 
let's give a couple of slides of data from the CDC from early on in, um, uh, in, in, in the COVID thing. So things started, well, really, really started going in March, 2020. And now, um, uh, so this was only just the first four or five months. And I know the slide is hard to see, but we're just gonna be concentrating here on the white non-Hispanic cases, roughly a third. 35% uh, of the cases were, uh, were white non-Hispanic. You can't read that up here is the Hispanic uh, white thing, almost the same, and the black is here. Uh, those are the, the main bulk ones. But by contrast, if you look at the deaths that happened uh, between this, among in the white non-Hispanic category, it's gone from one third roughly up to a half. Now, if you just take a look at this, this goes completely against what you, the, the what everyone was saying in the newspapers about uh, about that somehow that it, the the pandemic, especially early on, was really hitting all of the uh, 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 the minority communities really hard. Uh, and, and it was having a, a profound effect there. But why is it that uh, among the white non-Hispanic, uh, you could think privileged people, they had a third of the cases, but a half of the deaths. So what is going on? So let's try to, to answer that by looking at a breakdown of things uh, again for this March to June CDC data, and uh, uh, here it's it's lots and lots of cases, a million plus cases, and a hundred thousand plus deaths. This is not a small data set by any means, but we're going to break things down by age. So, say among people in the thirty to forty nine range, twenty six point five. So all of this is for whites, not uh, non Hispanic whites. So. 26.5 of the people, percent of the people 30 to 49 uh, had COVID, 26.5% um, of the 30 to 49s who uh, had, co had COVID were white, um, non-Hispanic. Non but in that range, even though we had 26.5% of the cases, the deaths were only 16.4%. So if you look at this a little bit uh, 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 a little bit more closely, you'll see, well, first of all, in the zero to four thing, thankfully, there were very, very few cases, especially early on. I read somewhere that among the 100,000 deaths, 13 were in this category early. So, we could just sort of ignore this thing. It was really microscopic. But then just going uh, line by line, uh, again, if you were, were white, then your probability of, uh, of dying was less than your compatriots in every one of these categories. This you can say, okay, the better outcomes are due to the privilege and the better health care and better diagnosis and these various finger things to see about your, your blood oxygen levels. Um, but still, how does that explain if uh, the whites are doing better in every one of these things, how does this explain the 35 to 49 percent? And the key thing here is uh, the, the, the key is it's right, sort of not written with this, but uh, white people are old. And this can really be seen, not in the, the assembled room, but of, of, uh, of in the general population, 9% of, of whites are 75 or older. But uh, of non-white uh, only three percent are seventy-five percent uh, are, are seventy-five years or or older. 
So in these two problematic categories, and these were really where I now need to put better outcomes in quotes, because quite honestly, the death rate was absolutely huge. It really, uh, 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 again, the lion's share of all of the deaths were really just in these two categories. So what was happening was that um, uh, just there were just so many more very elderly whites that that was dominating what's happening throughout this. And that can be just explaining this. But but you one needs to be really careful just if you looked at that first graph uh, about I mean, the explanation is somewhat deeper than, um, than, than, than one might expect. Okay, so now continuing on. What do you get if you cut an avocado into a large number of pieces? Guacamole, yes. Everyone, you're good. good. <laughs> okay, well, we needed that after the talking about this, and especially since there's going to be another, maybe not completely cheery topic coming up. This is something known as the low birth weight paradox that was studied excessive, uh, uh, extensively by this Alan Wilcox, um, who was a, a researcher at uh, NIH and Research Triangle. Uh, so in order to get to this, I need to define three things. First of all, the median weight of a newborn is 3.6 kilograms uh, and for years gone by, uh, a baby was labeled LBW, low birth weight, if uh, his or her birth weight was less than or equal to 2.5 kilograms. And for the chart that's going to come, the mortality rate is of, of these babies is the number per 1,000 that do not survive their first year. So... Uh, a lot of data was collected on this. And here it was split by whether or not the mother smoked during pregnancy. So the mortality rate uh, per thousand. So in the general population, so just among the non-LBW uh, uh, babies, uh, for maternal non-smokers, the death rate was 11.1, .1, so enough, uh, roughly a 1% chance of, or 99%, let's be positive, a 99% chance that, that the baby would survive the first year. Uh, but among maternal smokers, it's, it's slightly worse than that. But if you go to the low birth weight things, then 210 out of 1,000 low birth weight babies die to maternal non-smokers, but if the, the if the mother smoked during pregnancy, then this rate would drop to 114. So roughly get cut in half. Okay, and this was published by this guy Yerushalmi, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this. This uh, was actually. I would say an important paper in, a, in an odd way, but at this moment, you might want to think, what is going on? And hint, I'm not advocating that mothers smoke during pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that that's that's going to be that that's going to be the kicker, and I'll be able to illustrate this by by a series of pictures. But good, uh, great. So what is going on with this? Well, let's start off just straight. Uh, this uh, I couldn't get anything else, but this this is for birth weights uh, in Norway, but I think it's basically universal. Um, uh, so the average birth weight is like 3.6 kilograms, and this is very roughly a normal distribution. However, to the left, there is a tail. The tail to the left is much longer than the tail to the right. But fundamentally, it's it's a normal distribution as one would expect. The numbers are large. Uh, what else could it be? Okay, so on this. Uh, doctors have arbitrarily determined 
that uh, the low birth weight cutoff is uh, at 2.5 kilograms, which in the normal, uh, in the standard population, cuts off this tail. Now, here are just the grim things to think about. This includes almost all preterm babies, but also ones with genetic problems with uh, uh, just something wasn't right in this. Uh, so here I hesitate to write everything in red. It sounds like things are doomed when in fact, the good news is really 80% of these did survive for at least the first year. But, uh, but it's really the flattened part of this tail. Okay, now, another thing that is known and has been tested many times throughout is the effect of mother smoking through pregnancy. This decreases the average birth weight, but it still happens a lot. And uh, this, this, this can be quantized. So it's known that mother smoking during pregnancy decreases the birth weight by approximately 200 grams. So forget the units on this, but roughly what's happening is we're getting this normal distribution, but we're shifting it to the left by 200 grams. So the peak is going to be uh, 200 grams off and the same general shape. But then what really the problem is, in my mind, the definition of low birth weight is not changed depending on whether or not the mother smokes. So as a result, if we cut off this thing, now there's going to be in the blue, a much bigger tail. This is exactly what you were saying, that uh, among mothers that smoke, there are many, many more low birth weight babies, but also many, many of them are fundamentally healthy. I'm not saying that smoking is a good thing, but fundamentally there's no, uh, there, there's not much wrong with them. So if you're looking at a ratio, think you're just dumping in lots of fundamentally health, healthy babies and you're putting them to the left of this divide as opposed to the right. So to, to summarize this, the point is uh, because of the shift in birth weights, well, at not, making a corresponding change in the definition of a low birth weight, many more fundamentally healthy babies of smoking moms are put into this category. Uh, but among the low birth weight babies, so, so thus uh, there's a greater share of fundamentally healthy babies, and that's what's going to cause that ratio to go down. So just to be clear, this does not mean that the mother's smoking is good for the baby, causing the shift to the left. However, this Yerushalmi, who uh, was a biostatistician, uh, is trained at Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, moved up uh, through the ranks, and then actually in the 1950s, he, he created the biostatistics lab at, at Berkeley. So he really had uh, a, a national following with this. He was also a smoker. And this was right at the time, 68 to 71 was when uh, there were just discussions about smoking, that everyone smoked all the time, but, but the uh, CDC, others were trying to cut back and the FDA warning labels were, were coming on. But he used this data, this fact, uh, scroll back here, uh, this, th this is his data. He was using this as an argument in favor of mother smoking or saying it wasn't bad because look, here's actually a benefit. Um, in hindsight, I find this quite shocking, uh, but worse, this paper that he submitted got into the general press and two titles that I managed to find in the Boston Record American, I don't think it still exists, the, the title, Mothers Needn't Worry, Smoking of Little Risk to Baby, from 1971. Worse, In Defense of Smoking Moms, in this Family Health magazine. That was still, a, I, I remember that from being a kid. 
uh, that uh, uh, this really got in to, to, to the thing. Um, so to see that this effect doesn't all have to be the smoking versus non-smoking. If you want, say, a more a cheerier example of this whole thing, uh, so this Wilcox, who's been studying this effect, uh, if you just concentrate on babies that are born in Colorado, then maybe it's because of the elevation, who knows, but uh, the percentage of babies born that are low birth weight is significantly above that of the U.S. population, but uh, for any other purpose, they're just as healthy as in other states. So I don't mean this to be a, a smoker versus non-smoker thing. Um, this is this I view as being a, a cheery, cheery thing. I would say, if anything, among epidemiologists, that the big problem might be that uh, just absolutely fixing this low birth weight thing at 2.5 kilograms come hell or high water is what's causing these these seeming um, seeming paradoxes. But in any event, um, just the takeaways, if you want to look at all of these examples taken together, the main takeaway I would have is that we're looking at a single data set, but in by doing various means of subdividing, the same data set can be used to justify contradictory conclusions. So I'd say beware of headlines or, or sound bites uh, with this. If there are any journalism majors here uh, uh, that, that want to really be careful about how to, uh, how to in interpret this. And then finally, to link it back to my title, in short, averaging averages can be a perilous undertaking. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you'll uh, enjoy the snacks in the cross and the hall.